Uh, there was a time in the 1950s and 1960s when parliament was at the center of India's public life, when you could hold to an ideology but still listen to somebody else, when you could believe in something but still understand another person, when you could have friendship, you could have love, you could have sympathy, you could have empathy, but you may not have agreement. Uh, and I think that was possible at a time. And Vajpayee, in a sense, exemplified that. You know, he exemplified a man who, uh, who is paradoxical, uh, he's inconvenient, uh, but he's real. And because he's so inconvenient, because he can't be boxed into this box or the other box, um, I found him seductive, I found him challenging. There is something within you which is incorrigibly irreverent. And I think that's what I found about Vajpayee. The incorrigible irreverence and iconoclasm of the man who wouldn't accept any kind of orthodoxy. Uh, in the Nehruvian time, he insisted on the Hindu nationalist viewpoint. In the Hindu nationalist Sangh Parivar, he insisted on the Nehruvian viewpoint. Uh, when it came to being in power, he was the Nehruvian. When it came to be in opposition against Indira Gandhi, he was the roaring Hindu nationalist who completely changed his colors and became a uh, middle of the road pluralist when he was in power. So what was he? What is this quicksilver shifting mercurial will o' the wisp? You know, I felt I was running in a field chasing a fire, a, a firefly. Yeah. Hi, I'm Shoma Chaudhary. Thanks for watching Inquiry. The BJP today is synonymous with Prime Minister Modi and his personality. But there's another leader that impacted the party's destiny and by extension the country's in perhaps equally huge and complex ways. As the party wins election after election, it's an interesting time to track the trajectory of the leader that first made the BJP and its Hindutva ideology acceptable, Prime Minister Atal Bihari Vajpayee. Journalist Shagrika Ghosh has written a biography that is full of sharp and surprising insights. Was PM Vajpayee a liberal dressed in Hindutva clothes, or was that just a mask? Would he have persisted with the better angels of his nature if the electorate had not let him down? If he had had his way, would India have inherited a right of center party without communal and authoritarian overtones? The public milestones of PM Vajpayee's life is too well known to go over. So this conversation does not focus on his jigalbandi with LK Advani, the Ram Mandir movement, his response to Tehelka and the suppression of the press, or his infamously controversial speech in Goa. Instead, it focuses on the fascinating and lesser known dilemmas of his personal and public journey. This conversation was hosted by the Quorum Mumbai a few days ago. Do watch. I'd like to say about Shagrika, you know, uh, Saloni has already told you a lot about her. But again, what I was struck by when I was reading the book is that Shagrika has lived up to the absolute fundamentals of being a liberal, which is that here's a subject and a man and an ideology that she's publicly opposed to. But in her examination of that person, she has done it with respect, with empathy, and with admission of what is admirable even while she continues to debate and dissent. And if all of us can reclaim that space as liberals and otherwise, uh, you know, India would be in a safer space than what it is today. So thank you, Shagrika, for a wonderful, wonderful book. Uh, so I'm, with that, I'm going to plunge into, as I said, examining this compound man and what that theater war left its impact on India. And so to begin with, Shagrika, I'd, I'd like to actually begin with your own process of discovery which was that here was a man that so much was known about already. So when you went into a deep dive into his life, what was the surprise elements for you? You know, what was the discovery for you? So it's uh, terrific to be here with all of you. Thank you so much. And thanks so much to Vivek and to Shoma as well. Uh, thanks so much for appreciating the book so intensely. Um, you know, you put your finger on it. Uh, the reason why I, as a liberal, chose to write about Vajpayee was precisely because uh, 
You know, if you look at our lives today, we are so polarized. Um, you're in this camp or you're in another camp, friendships are breaking, uh, family ties are breaking, relationships are actually breaking because of ideological differences. There was a time when this was not so. Uh, there was a time in the 1950s and 1960s when parliament was at the center of India's public life, when you could hold to an ideology but still listen to somebody else when you could believe in something but still understand another person, when you could have friendship, you could have love, you could have sympathy, you could have empathy, but you may not have agreement. Uh, and I think that was possible at a time. And Vajpayee, in a sense, exemplified that. You know, he exemplified a man who, uh, who is paradoxical, uh, he's inconvenient, uh, but he's real. And because he's so inconvenient, because he can't be boxed into this box or the other box, um, I found him seductive, I found him challenging. Uh, you know, in a way, writing a biography is a bit like, uh, I would say, method acting. You know, if you think about Stanislavski and the, uh, uh, the art of acting, uh, when an actor is playing, say, Richard III or uh, Napoleon, or, you know, a character which is not uh, very sympathetic, but you still have to play that character, and you have to find the truth of that character. What is the kernel of that character that can explain what he does and why he says what he says? And I think in that sense, you know, writing a biography, whether it was my biography of Indira Gandhi or Vajpayee, I had to plumb the, the depths of a character to find out what is the truth of this particular individual. Uh, and you can't sit in judgment. And I think that's what being liberal is, right? Is to understand and to empathize and to understand who you're talking to and understand who you're dealing with. And I thought that it was necessary to rescue that process of understanding. Yeah, so that absolutely, Shagrika, and that, you know, that'll play out through the book and everything that I uh, steer yeah. you towards will keep yeah. you know, explicating that. But uh, for, for the audience who haven't had this deep dive into Ashwa and those who haven't read the book, yeah. I wanted you to zero in on, you use the word kernel. So if yeah. you were to zero in on the kernel of Vajpayee, what would it be? And my question to you was, what was your, like, what were the surprises you encountered? So the surprises I encountered was, you know, there were so many. Uh, I think in many ways, the biggest surprise was, and the biggest discovery that I made, was that, you know, the personal is the political. So if in your personal life, you lead an unconventional and bohemian personal life, then it stands to reason that you will be someone in politics who will not accept any orthodoxy. You know, Vajpayee lived all his life with a married woman he had fallen in love with in college. He fell in love with her when he was in college. Uh, they, their lives went in different ways. They never married, uh, yet they were always in love. There is the line from the uh, film Khamoshi, Pyar ko pyar hi rehne do, ise koi naam na do. So I think that was the nature of their relationship. It was, uh, it was nameless, but it was a love. And, they, and he lived with her, this married woman, and her husband and her children all his life, yeah. openly, much to the shuddering outrage of the Sangh Parivar. Now, when you do that in your personal life, then it stands to reason that politically, you will also not accept any orthodoxy, right? You're an iconoclast, you're irreverent. There is something within you which is incorrigibly irreverent. And I think that's what I found about Vajpayee the incorrigible irreverence and iconoclasm of the man who wouldn't accept any kind of orthodoxy. Uh, in the Nehruvian time, he insisted on the Hindu nationalist viewpoint. In the Hindu nationalist Sangh Parivar, he insisted on the Nehruvian viewpoint. Uh, when it came to being in power, he was the Nehruvian. When it came to be in opposition against Indira Gandhi, he was the roaring Hindu nationalist who completely changed his colors and became a uh, middle of the road pluralist when he was in power. So what was he? What is this quicksilver shifting mercurial will o' the wisp? You know, I felt I was running in a field chasing a fire, a, a firefly, yeah. uh, because he's one day something, the next day he was something else. And so, uh, in that sense, I think when you are um, a uh, uh, someone taking such a big gamble on your personal life, and you know, if you look at that generation, Joma, you know, the 1940s was this period of tumult and um, 
uh, movement, you know, the Gandhian movement and the civil disobedience movement and the independence movement. And I think at that time, all the people who plunged into that movement were unconventional in their personal lives. I mean, if you look at Ram Manohar Lohia, he never married. He lived with, a, um, with Rama partner. Mitra all his life. Um, uh, he, in, in fact, disdained marriage. Uh, Mahatma Gandhi was very open about his experiments with, um, uh, with uh, you know, with, with celibacy. Ce ce celibacy and sexuality and, you know, uh, with Brahmachari. Uh, if you look at Nehru... Your, your use of the word Brahmachari reminds me of a wonderful quote in your book, which yeah. uh, you ascribe to Vajpayee. Yeah. Where when uh, intrepid journalist asked him about his relationship with uh, Rajkumari, he said, "Me kuara hu par brahmachari nahi." <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah. And then when he was foreign minister, uh, somebody asked him, "You know, Mr. Vajpayee, forget about Kashmir, uh, forget about Tibet and China and Russia and USS. Tell us about Mrs. Call." You know, in a in a in a press conference, and he said, "Kashmir jaisa masla hai." <laughs> So, yeah. you know, I mean, that, that's, that was the man. He was, in, he was an incorrigible iconoclast who, who I think um, exemplified the uh, unconventional and bohemian personal life of the 1940s generation. So, you know, if you use that as the kernel of the man and, yeah. you know, you have other dichotomies, like you use a very interesting phrase that he's a middle compound man, you yes, know. Yes, the and middle that, compound character. Yeah, that, that for me yeah. was actually the kernel yeah. of yeah. him and... Again, like if I keep using him as a microcosm for India, that's mm. the beauty of India. You know that yes. we are diverse, we are plural, no extremities, mm. hopefully persevere in our country. Yeah. Uh, and so, you know, he kind of embodies that yeah. all the time. And I had the yeah. same feeling reading the book. I yeah. was so sympathetic for you. I was like, yeah. how did she put this together? Because <laughs> it really is very varied, you know, yeah. and he's constantly changing his impulses. Yeah. But so just again for the audience to grasp the man, I'd like us to split our conversation into two parts. Mm -hmm. One is to evoke the man you met mm -hmm. in your search for him. And then there are the masks that he wore, you yeah. know, which is his political life. Yeah. So when you're talking about this man, you spoke of him being sexually and in his personal life liberated. But even the influences that went into shaping him are so varied and contradictory. And I thought that, again, gives a very interesting perspective to him. So yes. would you share that? With Absolutely. You know, I think it took a number of varied experiences to make up the man he was. Uh, he joined the RSS in the teeth of opposition from his father. Uh, his father was an inspector of schools in the Gwalior state, and the Gwalior state was, as you know, a loyal state, loyal to the British Raj. Uh, the scion of the Gwalior family was called George Jivaji Rao Sindhya, after George V. So, you know, it was very, um, very loyalist to the Raj. And his father was inspector of schools in the Gwalior state. So he was completely disapproving of the RSS and the Sangh Parivar, and Vajpayee, uh, you know, plunged into the uh, Hindu nationalist RSS very early in life. Yeah. Uh, and that became, in a sense, his, his playground. And I discovered what it was about him uh, in the early period of the Shakhas that drew him there. You know, friendship in the 1920s was a novelty. Uh, Dipankar Gupta points this out very well in an article that, you know, today we take friendship for granted. I mean, you and I are friends and we don't know each other. We're not family members. But in the 1920s, uh, social life was kinship, you know, caste networks, uh, families, cousins, cousins yeah. uh, you know, people who are married to each other. Friendship was a novelty. Uh, the friend was a novelty. The friend outside the kin group, the friend outside the caste group was a novelty. And the shakha was friends outside caste and kin and, and, uh, and uh, you know, clan. It was you meeting different castes, different people, yeah, different, yeah. different regions, so it was liberating. You know, today we have a, a, an image of the RSS, but in those days, it was this kind of liberation from a very drab, humdrum, middle, lower middle class family mm -hmm. life. And so he entered this liberating experience, and because he was such a brilliant speaker and orator, he was uh, immediately uh, adopted by Goldwalker, uh, who, and he became Goldwalker's golden boy. And then he, he, you know, he grew in the RSS because of his ability to orate and to speak. But then his path crossed with someone very different from the RSS, who was Shama Prasad Mukherjee. And Shama Prasad Mukherjee, you know, at, uh, was brilliant. He was in Nehru's cabinet. 
Shama Prasad Mukherjee was a politician. He was a politician who was a Hindu nationalist of the Hindu Mahasabha, but he was a politician. And he wanted to create that national alternative to the Congress power. and a national alternative to, to Nehru and to seek power. So Vajpayee's trajectory into politics was through Shama Prasad Mukherjee, who took him under his wing and whose, uh, whose uh, protege he was, and with whom he joined the Janasang. Yeah. And throughout Vajpayee's tenure, uh, you can see that he's always emphasizing, I'm an elected politician, I'm elected. What do the RSS know about those who are elected? I have won elections, I have won votes. You know, he used to say yeah. that, I have elected to office. I'm not a missionary yeah. working in a school. I have won elections. You know, so, and because I've won elections, I am accountable to parliament. You know, I mean, and Parliament was his womb. It was his birthplace. It's where he grew up. It's where he, where he um, came into contact with Nehru, who became a fundamental influence in Vajpayee's life because he hero worshipped Nehru. I mean, if you read the eulogy which he wrote on Nehru's death, you know that Raj, uh, Bharat Mata's Rajkumar, and yeah. you know he that he that in fact Nehru. was one of the big surprises in the yeah. book for me was this relationship and acknowledged respect yeah. that Vajpayee had yeah. for Nehru. And again, uh, Shagrika has a wonderful anecdote in the book where Vajpayee actually suggested not just putting Nehru's picture back in the hall when he became foreign minister, they had taken it off, he put it back, but that he asked for him to be put on a pedestal yes. so that he would always look over uh, parliament, you know, and yes. be a kind of custodian of India's parliamentary democracy. Yeah, and, and you know, just that was you were, you were making, yeah, and you were making the point about a comparison with today. I mean, in, just imagine in 1999, Vajpayee's government fell in parliament by one vote. By one vote in parliament, the government fell. Can you imagine a government falling today by one vote? I mean, that vote would be, you know, bought and sold a hundred times. But I mean, to fall, you know, that was the integrity of parliament, yeah. you know, in those days. Uh, that by one vote, a government could fall. So he, he began his life in parliament. So Nehru and parliamentary democracy. And remember, Nehruvian parliamentary democracy made possible the emergence of Nehru's greatest opponents because it was within the platform of Nehruvian parliamentary democracy that Nehru's opponents could flourish. Yeah. I mean, they weren't banned or muzzled or called Tukre Tukre gang or Khan market gang or, you know, some other gang and, and you know, told to, you know, and, and, and muzzled, their voices were not muzzled. They flourished in Nehruvian parliamentary democracy and Vajpayee recognized that. That, yeah. that, you know, and again, uh, there, you know, Shagrika, again in the spirit, like if we look yeah. at ourselves as custodians of being liberal, yeah. You know, I've, I've often actually spoken to people in the BJP and RSS to understand what is the heart of their, uh, you know, dislike of Nehru. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, now is not the time to go into that. But just when you're saying that he would never muzzle voices, again, in all fairness, he did dismiss governments. He did. He did. He know, did. The Kerala government, of course, was a great blot on his tenure. Yeah. And, and again, but that was what was interesting when you look back on the history of India, yeah. that so many who hold to principles when they come into power, you know, in fact, when the Janta Party came, they started dismissing governments and yeah. Vajpayee, who was so opposed to the center yes. dismissing, yes. was suddenly standing by, yes. of all people, Shashi uh, Bhushan, you know, who yeah, was the yeah, great yeah. civil activist Absolutely. lawyer now. So there's a humility in understanding how yes. easily you can slip yes. from your yes. principles. But just before we move on, uh, for the audience that you, you've listed Nehru, the RSS, Shama Prasad Prasad Mukherjee, Mukherjee, who was an anglicized, westernized, yes. you know, Latians, what yes. we would call Latians yes. today. Golwalkar, yes. who was the rustic, ascetic, you know, lower, lower in, uh, middle class Indian leader, pure purist. And then there was Hiran Mukherjee. Hiran you know? Mukherjee. So, <laughs> so you're really talking about a man who yes. was a composite of Nehruvian, socialist, communist, yes. RSS, Hindutva. But that's, that's the beauty of parliament, right? I mean, uh, Vajpayee's, again, you know, this is uh, the spirit which we miss so much today, is the camaraderie and the friendship that is possible across ideological barriers. Um, Vajpayee's great friend was the communist stalwart Hirendranath Mukherjee, very anglicized, aristocratic communist, Oxford educated, used to speak English with an Oxford accent and used to hurl these, you know, speech after speech. And you know, Shoma, I must tell you that for anyone who has the time and inclination to read the parliamentary debates of the 1940s and 50s, 
please do read them if you have the time. They are brilliant. I mean, they are erudite, they're knowledgeable, they're full of jokes, they're full of, uh, uh, you know, witticisms. It's a real treat to read those uh, those speeches. And of course, with Bhupesh Gupta, you know, his, uh, his other great friend who was also a communist. And there's a great, very funny story that uh, Bhupesh Gupta, uh, you know, Vajpayee had once gone to see this 1950s film called Night of the Generals um, in Golcha cinema. And Bhupesh Gupta, the communist leader, was sitting a few rows ahead of him. And he turns around and spots Vajpayee and says, Are Vajpayee? You've come to see this film, but it's in English. How will you understand it? So Vajpayee says, how come you've come to see this film? It's in Russian. Do you understand Russian? <laughs> so, you know, and I think that yeah. was the kind of uh, camaraderie yeah, that I, existed. Between, again, uh, sharing the joy of her book. Uh, I'm going to share one quick anecdote and then I want to move to some of the more yeah. deeper, yeah. you know, when she's talking about this irreverent, exuberant, uh, you know, witticism that Vajpayee was capable of. I think Din Dayal Upadhyay, which was another big influence yes. in his life, was speaking about why he's vegetarian. Oh no, someone said, Nanaji Deshmukh said why he's a vegetarian. He said that Upadhyay came in his dreams and told him not to have chicken. And Vajpayee, who was an absolute gourmet, said, Really, Upadhyay uh, ji came to your uh, mind in your dreams, and that's all the important thing he could talk about was chicken, you know. He so. said, Itne bade aadmi aapke sapne mein aate hain, aur itna hi kehte hai ki chicken mat khao. <laughs> So, you know, there was so, all of that. And you know, this, this really funny anecdote, which I have to tell, and it, it really is revealing about how Vajpayee treated his own party members. You know, in 1988, Vajpayee developed a kidney ailment, and he had terrific relations with uh, Rajiv Gandhi, and Rajiv Gandhi sent him to the United States for a, uh, for two, uh, as part of the UN delegation to have his kidney ailment treated. And Vajpayee, when he was in the United States, was diagnosed with some form of malignant uh, cancer. And he wrote a poem at that point, Maut se than gai, meaning how I'm confronting death. And the poem came back to India and was circulated, and the party men and the Jan Sang, uh, Sang Parivar all started saying, Are Vajpayee is dying, Vajpayee is dying. You know, he's written Maut se than gai. Later on, it was established that the test was just a mistake and it was very easily cured and he was fit and fine and he came back to uh, Delhi. And when he came back to Delhi, a huge crowd of uh, party men arrived at the airport to greet him as he was arriving back from the United States. So Vajpayee turns around to his assistant Shiv Kumar and says, Are, ye soch rahe hain ki abhi to maut ka dastavez likkar bheja tha, abhi zinda kaise lot aya hai. <laughs> <laughs> so it was, uh, it was a sort of a, a comment, I thought, on what he felt about his own party. I mean, you know, that here they were celebrating my death, <laughs> and now they're wondering, here he is back, <laughs> a hale and hearty. So, you know, they're, they're wonderful anecdotes yeah. like that, which established... He was incredibly funny. Actually, that's one of the discoveries I made, is what a jokester he was, you know. Yeah. So, jokester, poet, yes. you know, like you said, this compendium of many influences. Yes. Um, a, a gourmet, a drinker, yeah. you know. Yeah. Uh, uh, Verging on the alcoholic, I like would say. The great Bloomsbury Club, he was yeah. like Virginia <laughs> Woolf living with her. Yeah. It was another interesting detail was that Mr. Call, uh, you know, was very solicitous of Vajpayee yeah. all the time and would find yeah. out if he'd eaten correctly or yeah. not. Yeah. So the fact that they could establish a home that was so... Yeah liberal and mature and adult in their relations yeah, with each other yeah. was a massive discovery for me. Very yeah, interesting, yes. Yeah. But, you know, because there's so much to examine yes. in him, I want to move away. That when we examine the impact of a man like this mm -hmm. on India's politics, you know, there's this, like I was saying, in a way he embodies the war for India's soul. Mm -hmm. uh, he kept going back to the ideological roots that he came from. So I'd like you to talk about now, you know, the kind of conflicted relationship yeah. he had with uh, Vajpayee, uh, with Adwani, with the RSS, you know, even with Modi and with this whole ideology, yeah. you know. So if we start with uh, just the two points when you think he really let down the liberal in himself, you've called him a Saffron Nehru and a Swadeshi mm -hmm. Nehru. Which are the two or three points you would pick in his career when he completely let down that impulse in himself to be plural and diverse for India? Yeah, that's a very good question. And in fact, you know, to use Amit Shah's words, uh, I would say to understand Vajpayee, chronology samjhiye. You know, <laughs> there has to be a, you know, that's why I've organized the book chronologically. Because uh, chronologically, if you look at Vajpayee, uh, he starts off, in the RSS, and he starts off as the Saffron Nehru in the 1950s. 
you know he when he uh, founds the uh, when he actually sorry when he founds the janta when he joins the janta party vajpai out of all the jansang members is the most eager to say bye bye to the jansang and meld into the janata and he says at the time that we have left forever the politics of the jansang we don't want anything to have with the jansang we want to be in the janta party you know because to him the janta party was what he had been craving for the legitimate opposition the normal opposition the mainstream opposition which is what he always wanted to be he didn't want to be marooned on an ideological island you know he didn't want to be marooned in a, um, a saffron untouchable corner he wanted to be uh, there as a national alternative to the congress so he was the most eager to join the janta party and he said at the time you know deepak bujhane ka waqt aa gaya hai surya uday ho gaya hai you know it, the sun has risen it is time to put out the deepak but the deepak was the uh, symbol of the janasang and uh, uh, he was the most eager to join the janata and he said at the time that we must forget the janasang and get participated in the janata when he formed the bjp in 1980 uh, the bjp was founded as a party of gandhi vadi samajwad yeah. you know i mean it seems difficult for us to understand at the moment it's such a uber saffron force but it was founded as a party of gandhian socialism vajpai was the gandhian socialist uh, leader of the bjp the founder of the bjp was gandhian socialist so it was yeah. the and, motto and, was gandhian socialism and another socialism. phrase which came as a massive surprise to me gandhian socialism and positive secularism positive secularism were the two bulwarks yeah. of the bjp yes. at its founding in founding. 1980 yeah. in the 19 the, the shimmering moment beside the mumbai sea you know with the, the mumbai mahadevishan and um, and but unfortunately for vajpai and this is why i say chrono chronologically unfortunately for vajpai this gandhivadi samajwad bjp kept losing elections because just at the moment that vajpai was charting the gandhian socialist path by irony of fate indira gandhi who had come back to power in 1980 was actually pursuing the hindu consolidation path you know it's very paradoxical <laughs> because when she came back to power in 1980 she started playing the politics of hindu vote banks she did it in assam she did it in kashmir she did it in punjab and the rss was actually gravitating towards indira gandhi because they didn't like gandhivadi samajwad the, the saffron forces were completely against this gandhian socialism vijay rajya sindhya and bombay said what is this nonsense gandhian socialism are we are we as another congress or what you know we are, we are not supposed to be you know gandhian and socialist and this is not us yeah and uh, the rss was completely opposed to uh, this kind of secular socialist line that vajpai was taking and in 1981 80 the this gandhian socialist bjp lost assembly elections to indira gandhi uh, 1983 lost uh, in uh, lost in andhra and karnataka and the most uh, uh, worst setback of all in 1983 the jammu and kashmir elections the bjp the gandhian socialist bjp got zero nil nothing and they lost hindu jammu so vajpai had the ground Crisis taken away confidence. from under his yeah. feet you know and in those days and as i wrote recently in my article uh, about loss proof neta today's netas you know lose election lose election lose election they never step down i think the lady there was telling me how much she enjoyed that so today you know uh, mayawati can lose in 2012 she can lose in 2014 she can lose in 2017 she can lose in 2019 but she's still the supremo of the bsp but uh, uh vajpai every time he lost elections he had to step down in 1972 the janasang kept losing assembly elections vajpai had to step down now in 1983 when you know when vajpai lost uh the the vajpai led bjp lost the jammu and kashmir election it was a crisis for the sangh parivar and they said what the hell is vajpai doing what is this gandhivadi samajwad this is not us the workers don't want to work for this you know we want ideology 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 and then in 1984 came the body blow because you know the, i've written there that the woman who uh, he could never defeat in her life almost extinguished his career with her death Yeah. because when she died in 1984 indira gandhi died in 84 the congress soared to 400 seats the bjp got two think about it the bjp got two the invincible vajpai was defeated shock defeat in gwalior you know his his his, his hometown yeah. his yeah. birthplace so this was and you know this was uh, uh, un, uh, completely uh, you know unacceptable to the sangh parivar and they said you know um that's it with vajpai no more gandhivadi samajwad uh, we are now you know we've had it with this secular socialist line and 
Advani takes over the BJP in 1986 and takes the BJP completely into the Ram Janmabhoomi movement with the Palampur resolution of 1989. Right. And that's it for Vajpayee. He never again becomes BJP president after that. Yeah. You know, so he starts off by being, so it is a defeated, subdued Vajpayee who in the morass of defeat embraces the Ram movement. You know, yeah. in, in, a, in, a, in a moment where he's suffered defeat after defeat after defeat, he's tried Gandhi and socialism, he's tried Janta Party, he's been foreign minister of the Janta Party, he tried to chart that secular socialist path, defeated, chucked out of presidency, sacked, he embraces the Ram movement. Yeah. You know, now, so to me, he embraces the Ram movement and embraces the Ram Janmabhoomi movement. And of course, he gives up his, his liberal uh, pretensions. And of course, he gives up his liberal commitment to parliamentary democracy and all of that. And he embraces this, this uh, violent movement of the street. But he does it under duress yeah. as, a, as a thoroughly defeated uh, leader. So, you know, I'm, I, I absolutely uh, empathize with you not giving me direct answers to my question because there's yeah. just so much material there. Yeah, I mean, but, there's but, just but, so much to explain, yeah, you know, yeah, so yeah, which yeah, is why amazing. I think in 1986 he gives up that thing. But to understand why he does it, uh, we have to, you know, no, chronology some <laughs> Yeah. No, and in fact, again, uh, you know, the in, it helps give perspective when you see all of it put together like this that, you know, one thinks of even the RSS or the Sangh Parivar as a monolithic, yes. you know, one unified way of thinking. And to me, and it, it, I think it helps one understand, it also helps one, if necessary, resist. But you can only resist things if you understand it. You respect yes. what's uh, substantive about it, yes. you know, what may be correct about it. And then you can repudiate what's, you know, mutilated about it. I had to really and struggle with that one. Yeah. I had to struggle with the RSS. Yeah, and so I'm going to come yeah. and ask you about that. But for me, again, it was interesting that at one point, uh, Vajpayee had committed that if his government came to power, they would wrap up the RSS, you know? Yes. How was he allowed to exist after some saying something like that? Yes, <laughs> he, he gave an undertaking to M.G. Devasayaham, who I've quoted, saying that... Uh, if we come to power, if the Janta Party comes to power, we will, we will just, you know, wind up the, the RSS. Uh, I you, think th there's that. And the other, again, insight, because it would, you know, the wonderful thing about reading your book, or just more and more people now writing about this with this kind of granular yeah. detail, is that also then publicly you can push back on so many assumptions, you know. So mm. another very interesting insight you gave was that, uh, Sardar Patel, that the BJP adores and builds massive mm -hmm. statues of now, forced the RSS to actually have, have a written constitution, have a written constitution yeah. where they would swear allegiance to the constitution and to the national yeah. flag, you know. So the party that now positions themselves as nationalist was forced to write a constitution. It was like an undertaking, like, you know, jail release. Ki only if you sign up for this will you be legitimized into our public life again. So for that to become the custodians of what one assumes is uh, national, you know, uh, security, it's so you know, it's I just like so many yes, somersaults. Yes, there's, there's you know? so many of these, and you know, I, I, and just coming back to your earlier question on the liberal, on the giving up of the liberal, you know, I had to str I had to really struggle with the RSS because I could, you know, it's a viewpoint completely different from my own, and then I had to ask the question: Was Vajpayee a liberal? Was Vajpayee a liberal? He wasn't. I don't think he was a liberal like maybe you and I are liberal. You know, uh, in the sense that as a liberal, I believe fundamentally in uh, the equality of citizens, in uh, uh, social and legal equality. I think Vajpayee was a liberal po uh, statesman when in government he was not an RSS man, but he was a Hindu nationalist. I think he believed that the Hindu or the upper caste Hindu male, let's put it this way, uh, he was of that conservative belief that the upper caste Hindu male was, you know, uh, 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 Bharat Mata ka Pratham Santan. You know, the, 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 the love of, for Bharat Mata was the highest in the Hindu. The, the Muslim and the Christian and, uh, and other castes did not have that kind of passion and commitment to Bharat Mata. 
That was Vajpayee. You know, and that's a view that a number of conservative congressmen also held. So it was not a liberal view. I don't think Vajpayee, and you know, because this question, as I said, I had to struggle with it. Why did Vajpayee, if he was so liberal, if he was so pluralistic, why did he never break with the RSS? He never broke with the RSS because he was a believer. He was a believer in Hindu nationalism, and he was a believer in Hindu conservatism, and he was a believer in this brand of Hindu conservatism. But at the same time, when in government, he embraced, uh, you know, Nehruvian principles of government. You get what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, he but was in government. He was not an RSS man. But when it came to his personal uh, belief system, yes, he was bohemian, and yes, he was personally irreverent. But, but he was also irreverent about Nehruvian secularism, in the sense he didn't yeah. accept Nehruvian secularism. So, you know, just to hold on to yeah. one, big, one strand, because yeah. the tree has yeah. many branches. Yeah. And in fact, again, he said, people would often say, are you the good man in a bad party? And he said, that's not possible. You can't have a good fruit or a good he branch. He never accepted he that. He never accepted that. Yeah. But just to come back to this RSS relationship, that I think, you know, you're saying that there's a chronology, but actually even later in his life, he kept, at many instances, after the Babri Masjid was brought down, he didn't stand his ground, but he was uncomfortable. With the Godhra riots, yeah. he didn't stand his ground. He wanted Modi to resign. Uh, he didn't stand his ground, but he was not comfortable. But I just want you to, again, this is to remind ourselves about the origins of the RSS. And... You know, when you said this about the Hindu chauvinism. Yes, Hindu chauvinism. To me, another big discovery which got reinforced by your book is that in its inception, you know, you keep using the word Bharatiya. He uses that as well. Mm. That their chauvinism was more about asserting Bharatiya civilizational history. And Hindu, it's a very... Mm. And, you know, Vikram Sampath right now is being uh, pilloried, you know, for his book on Savarkar. But Vikram Sampath also says this about the difference between Bharatiya and Hindu. And he says, actually, we were just claiming that this is a Hindu civilization. And Hindu is a word that foreigners used to use about this whole geography west, uh, yeah. east of the Hindu Kush. And it actually means Bharatiya. And he concedes that it's interchangeable. It's not about Hinduism, it's not about your religion, but just that you belong to this geography, you should feel loyal to its history and its civilization, you know? Yeah. So I found that strand, like today it's only about being Hindu or Muslim. Yeah. But it's important to remind the RSS that they themselves, the origin yeah. idea was Bharatiya, not Hindu. You know? Absolutely. And you know, today, the, the RSS and the Modi regime is all about state power. And state power bearing down on the individual and stamping out individual freedoms. The RSS, in its inception, was actually opposed to state power because they were opposed to the Nehruvian state. Again, if we could go back in time and put it in context, you know, the time in which Vajpayee operated and the RSS operated was the time of the Congress Leviathan, right? From 1952, 1952, 1957, 1962, the Congress was winning over 300 seats. This was the Congress of Jawaharlal Nehru, you know, adored in India, worshipped abroad, the God King, the hero of the freedom movement. So the dominance of the Congress was suffocating. And the dominance of the Congress was, was unbelievable. It seems difficult to think about it now. In 1967 elections, the, the Congress's seat tally came down. But again, in 1971, Indira Gandhi comes back and again goes up to 300 seats. So in that context, in the context when secularism and socialism are the official dominant paradigms, uh, the Hindu nationalist position becomes the oppositional position. You know, it becomes the uh, position to assail secularism, or assail socialism. So it becomes the doctrine of protest. But what has happened now is that these ideas of, uh, of, uh, using, uh, of, of, of using the democratic forum to challenge the Congress Leviathan is being turned on its head because the same force which was relying on democracy to challenge the Nehruvian Leviathan is now stamping out democracy which enabled it to exist in the first place. Yeah. You know, so, uh, so uh, and also on the, on the issue of Bharatiya, I mean, the whole idea is that it was against the Nehruvian westernized uh, Anglophone order that existed in India in the 1940s, 50s and 60s. And that was, and the oppositional ideology was Bharatiya, vernacular, Hindu, 
uh, Madhya Bharatiya, you know, as opposed to the sort of English speaking um, buffoons of, the, of Bombay and Delhi and, you know, Calcutta. So, uh, so uh, you were opposing the Macaulay Putras as a Bharatiya. You were opposing the English speaking gin drinkers as a, uh, you know, as a sort of, uh, uh, as, a, as a someone who was the, More the grit of India. The, the yeah, yeah. The, the sort of root of, you know, the, the sort of grit of India, the true authentic Bharatiya Indian. That was your oppositional ideology at the time. And you used the democratic framework to oppose this uh, Anglophone, Nehruvian, Macaulay-eyed order. But now you are turning uh, the entire clock backwards and stamping out the very democratic processes that allowed you to mount that protest in the fir first place. Yeah. No, I think so it's, it's important to reinforce all these things because if you look at the two stalwarts of the political yeah. stalwarts, you know, it's to, Vajpayee complete, and Modi. Yeah, and just yeah. to complete the point, you know, in the sense Vajpayee, you know, and I, and I researched this a lot, he, was, he never uh, did any puja. You know, I, should say, I was researching his uh, uh, daily routine. He, there's no puja. You never see him in a temple. You very rarely see Vajpayee, uh, uh, you know, in a shrine. I don't think he was even a believing Hindu. He wasn't a practicing Hindu. So Hindu nationalism or Hindu conservatism was the oppositional ideology to the Nehruvian Leviathan. Yeah. Right. It was the it was the doctrine of protest. It was the opposing viewpoint to create the national alternative. It was a political doctrine uh, in his personal life and you know Shakti Sinha who was um, Vajpayee's close aide told me that he never you know Vajpayee was not a practicing religious person at all and in fact he says in um, in um, in uh, you know in his uh, in one of his parliamentary speeches that I've never been to uh, I've never go to Shankaracharya's and the Sangh Parivar has this wonderful chutkule about him you know the chutkule is a limerick saying Netaji to Darya Ganj mein blue film dekhte hain then they eat the butter chicken in the butter chicken. Then they sit in the Mercedes car and say to people about the poverty of the people. So I think they thought that he was not a... He was really not really a part of the Hindu Paribar at all. So I don't think he was even a believer in any of those orthodoxies. But you know that again, it's like Savarkar himself actually was an atheist. He was an atheist. He was meat-eating. They were reformists. They were reformists. You know, like I said, there's so many strands, we'll, yes. we'll get sucked into yes. each of them. I just want to give a little taster to everyone yeah. before we open this up uh, for questions. Uh, Sal, will you tell me how much time we have before opening it up? Yeah, yeah okay. So, um, you know, part of our conversation was to get to, through Vajpayee to yeah. understand these many forces, Nehruvian, yeah. socialism, you know, all Western, rustic, modern, Indian, all of that. At the heart of it, if you were asking what made the RSS so attractive, and you said it was friendship, and another phrase in your book which really caught my eye was that someone in it says it was man-making, you yeah. know? And that it gave that sense of purpose and a sense of manhoodness, yeah, and it was manliness. liberating. Yeah. And I think, again, we, we, even those who oppose the RSS, you cannot begin to even be an opponent unless you understand the force of attraction that it has, you know. So through searching uh, for Vajpayee's, mm -hmm. can you help us understand what understandings did you come to about the RSS? You know, explain this man so, making. Yeah. yeah, that's the very, very interesting question. And in fact, I struggled to understand the RSS because obviously it enshrines a viewpoint utterly opposed to my own. Uh, I think what drew him to the RSS was again this, you know, the sort of uh, the poetry recitations he used to do, the declaiming he used to do, and the kind of platform it gave him. You know, and the RSS in um, uh, in Vajpayee's time was a sort of a, you know, you could immerse yourself in the male bonding of that of that kind of Hindu nationalist club. And I think it, in terms of man-making, yes, there were a lot of these um, pracharaks and a lot of these senior pracharaks who were very invested in creating what Golwalkar called be men with a capital M. And you know, if you, if you uh, read the literature of the time, I mean, uh, the humiliation of living in your own land, being beaten by white policemen, being kept out of uh, whites-only areas, 
uh, being treated as a second class citizen and being forced to travel in different compartments. I mean, Nehru writes about this. You know, when he's protesting the Simon Commission uh, protest and he's beaten from a, by a mounted policeman who's a white, uh, pink-faced officer, beaten by sticks, and he's saying, I'm standing in my own city of Allahabad and I'm facing the sticks from a white man. So the, the humiliation, the grinding, emotional, uh, sort of belittling, you know, that you feel at all times, uh, created this kind of, uh, you know, ferocious attachment to uh, militant and, uh, and uh, violent ideologies. And the fact is, you know, in the 1940s, again, if we go chronologically, uh, you know, this was the rise of the Muslim League. It was the rise of Jinnah. It was, you know, the, the times of partition, the formation of the League ministries, and intense Hindu-Muslim competition. Intense competition between Nehru and Jinnah. Intense competition between the Congress and the Muslim League. And it created radicalisms and communalisms on both sides. Right? And it created uh, religious identification on both sides. So I think the religious ferment of the 1940s and 50s fashioned the RSS, which is why I think the RSS now is out of date. I really think the RSS now is a, is a misfit in 21st century India. I think it fitted well in, you know, it didn't fit well, but it, it, it is understandable. It was giving voice in the 19th, to something. It was yeah. giving voice to something in the 40s and 50s. Now, it is giving voice to what? We're an independent nation. White man is not humiliating us. Uh, you know, they, the Pakistan no has been formed. So what now? Which is why I think the search for enemies. It's you so know, one day Khan market gang is your enemy. One day Tukre Tukre gang is your enemy. One day somebody else is your enemy. Because I think you're searching for enemies all the time because you need the... You know, I think actually what should have happened is what Gandhi uh, wanted to happen is that the Congress actually in 1947 should have split. There should have been a left-wing Congress under Nehru and a right-wing Congress under Patel. So India would have had a bipolar polity of a left-wing party and a right-wing party called different names, not called the Congress, where the right-wing energies could have gone towards Patel and the left-wing energies could have centered around Nehru. What has happened is by the Congress becoming so dominant and so oppressively dominant, opposition to the Congress was, you know, sent teetering out of the democratic game because yeah. you had to take up an extreme position and a militant position to take on the juggernaut. Because yeah. it was such a juggernaut. So, uh, so you know, if, if you know, I th this is was, was wha what I discovered, that if the Congress had actually split in 1947, as Gandhi wanted it to, uh, it, it, could have been have, it could have led to a healthier democracy. Right now, I think what has happened to the BJP, which is why I think Vajpayee would, have, um, would be turning in his grave, is that it's been taken out of the democratic game completely. And it doesn't exist anymore in the democratic parameter. And I think the reason why Vajpayee is so valuable is because he was a Hindu nationalist, he was a Hindu conservative, he was someone in the RSS all his life, but he remained rooted in parliament. Yeah, you know, you were just so, using those words is like yeah. sparking my brain yeah. to chase you down many yeah. other alleys, yeah. which is, you know, even the Hindu code bill. So when yeah. you said he's a Hindu co conservative, you know, I mean, today, uh, you know, acknowledgedly, two people speaking with each other who do not subscribe to the RSS ideology. I think there are also a lot of learnings to be yeah. had, you know, and I, you know, one was that it did shut out examination of many other forces, like the, the Congress liberal uh, intellectual yes. infrastructure, shut out even examining all these other very tumultuous energies in our country, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And so by reading Vikram Sampath's book on Savarkar or reading, you know, your book now, examining Vajpayee's life or so many others that are coming out, um, you know, it's interesting because it gives you new insight. And surprisingly, I came to the same sudden sense that, oh, the original ideas of the RSS are so irrelevant because it came out of the ferment of yes, partition, yes. as you said, and that competitive it's politics of the elites which no longer exists. It's you like the Muslim League, you know, which doesn't, which really was there in the 1940s and but doesn't have a raison d'etre now. Yeah. So I think the RSS now really does not possess a raison d'etre. Uh, it doesn't have a reason to exist. And by insisting on existing, uh, you know, it has to keep manufacturing a sort of partition-like atmosphere uh, in, in, you know, in 21st century India when that doesn't exist anymore. So it is actually preventing 
uh, India from moving forward into the 21st century because it's harking back constantly to the religious ferment of the 1940s. Yeah. So which is why I think the, the, the body in itself is a misfit today. Yeah, but it's again, I mean, we've run out of time and I wanted to actually discuss, uh, you know, I had asked you those tipping points in Vajpayee's yes, life yes. when he didn't stand up, uh, which was really when the Ram Mandir fell and after the Godhra riots. And interestingly, in 1942, in the Quit India movement, he actually signed a letter saying that he wasn't part of some protest and uh, others had to go to jail because of that. So all of that's interesting. You know, I, before we both, without having any opposition, write off the RSS, I think that's unfair. It's very important to know that, again, in all um, respect, is that they're also constantly changing and evolving yeah. and re-articulating themselves, yeah. Yeah. which they are. You know, yeah. I mean, uh, the Sarsang Chalak yes. says that no yes. India can exist without yes. Muslims. And, yes. this, and that's what I would, the final takeaway, if I may, from Vajpayee before we open it up, is that, that as liberals too, we would be wrong if you just try to imprison mm -hmm. the RSS, the BJP, etc. in mm -hmm. one mold, mm -hmm. because they have a lot of friction amongst mm -hmm. themselves mm -hmm. and they're also evolving. Right. Uh, and I think that's really captured in your book yeah. and that's important. It's a very healthy lesson for yeah. them and us yeah. to take away. And I think, you know, this is why I wrote the book because I was trying to understand and, try to di and trying to dialogue with a viewpoint different from my own. And I think that's what it's all about, right? It's about conversation, it's about dialogue, uh, it's about trying to understand another person. And I think if we try to keep up that process of understanding the other person, uh, so much can be solved. You know, instead of raging at strangers on the internet, or, you know, spending all day abusing someone we don't know on Twitter, uh, it's so much more productive to actually get out there move our physical selves into physical gatherings and have face-to-face -face conversations. You know, I've just come up, the, I came up, I came up with this. Just today, I read this wonderful story about a school in Meerut, which was uh, racked by communal violence. And the teachers got together and they paired uh, all the students as Hindu, Muslim, you know, they took a Hindu student and a Muslim student and paired them off. And they said, we want you to form friendships and we want you to dialogue with each other. And at the end of it all, uh, they ended up sort of saying, well, you know, we have the same problems, we have the same sort of problems with our brothers and sisters, we have the same problems at home, we have the same problems with our mothers and our fathers. And so, you know, a week of this, and there was a lot of conversation happening, there were a lot of arguments, but there was a lot of conversation happening. And this, this was written about in a, um, in a you know, in a, in a uh, news story. And dictators want us to stop conversing. You know, dictators want us to uh, stop the dialogue, which is why I think forums like this are so important, because they build mutual trust, and they build the, the bedrock of dialogue, you know? Yeah. So if we can keep dialoguing, then we can trust each other. But if we are imprisoned in mistrust, which is what dictators want us to do, and want to divide society, want us to stop trusting each other, uh, then, you know, uh, then we fall prey to these misconceptions about each other and Vajpayee was always trying for friendship. There's always something good about another person. Not everyone is all bad. Not everyone is, is all flawed. There's yeah. always something good about, you know, talking to someone else. And so, uh, to find that goodness in somebody else and to reach out and dialogue yeah. with that person was what he was all about. And that, I think, is the reason why I wrote the book, is to try and understand and find something about a person I can't uh, maybe fully agree with. Yeah. I think that's the takeaway we have from Vajpayee's life. He was trying all his life to find new friends. He was trying all his life to persuade and understand his adversary. So, so I think that's, that's the big takeaway for me. So I'm, I'm sorry if our animation <laughs> has left you all in the cold, but I would have loved to explore many other strands. You know, there were economic battles going on in yeah. the country within the Sangh Parivar, quite apart from Congress versus BJP. Uh, there were battles between Vajpayee and Mr. Modi, which are the two political stalwarts. And before, you know, we end this, when you're just talking about this, the common factor I found between them is that even when Mr. Modi came to power, he came to power by projecting a kind of centrist position, a hope, governance, sabka saath, sabka vikas. And, you know, when uh, Mr. Savarkar had to write the Hindu Mahasabha constitution, they had to drop the words Pitra Bhumi and Punya Bhumi yeah. and actually almost write a secular constitution for themselves, yeah. 
we just heard about the first BJP idea being, uh, you know, positive secularism. And so it's interesting to remember and remind ourselves that these impulses in India are there. It forces the extremes to come to the center. And we have to keep reminding and articulating ourselves. You, you know, know, the ec economic question, I think this, this will also resonate here that, you know, Vajpayee faced more wrath from the Swadeshi Jagran Manch, from the uh, Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh, uh, from other Uber Hindutva outfits for his economic program, which was privatization, globalization, you know, industrialization, on a, uh, 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 liberalization on a vast scale, much, uh, at a much faster rate than Narsim Rao. He faced more wrath from the Hindutva outfits than even Narsim Rao. You know, the Swadeshi Jagran Manch and the, uh, the, the, the uh, Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh actually held an open rally in which they called Yashwan Sinha, the then finance minister, an Apradhi. They said, uh, uh, Yashwan Sinha, Apradhi hai. And Pancha Janya wrote an editorial saying, Vajpayee's government belongs in the dustbin of history. And I was thinking at this time, you know, where is Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh and where is Swadeshi Jagran No, again, that's, that's not fair and because Bharatiya Mazdoor Sangh has resisted the Modi government's policies as well. But not as much as they did in Vajpayee's time, but they were literally on the war path with Vajpayee, you know, right. literally on the war path. And the reason why they're not doing it, I think, that much is because I think they are assimilated a little more in government. Yeah. We'll, we'll stop it there, you know, I mean, it's hard to kind of crystallize this into uh, anything absolutely like one takeaway. But I think if we can just keep reinforcing the complexity, plurality and diversity of India through its most, uh, you know, nationalist personalities, that itself is a victory. And to keep that uh, inquiry open, you know, plugging for my own show. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. That was really good. Uh, good evening, everybody. Uh, ma'am, I'm your big fan. Uh, I'm uh, Sangrika, ma'am. Uh, both, both you can take it. Uh, my question is, I'm a lawyer and a columnist with uh, Speaking Tree. My question is that, you know, uh, I'm no big fan of Modi, but one thing I do appreciate about him, you know, there is nothing called the nest in his idea. You know, not the grand grandfather, then the son and the grandson, you know. There are political workers, grassroots workers, who do not get their space because of this dynasty. So don't you feel that this something, I mean, I don't like the person uh, and his policies, but something appreciating that I find about him. And uh, my second suggestion is, when is uh, a next book coming on Pandit Jawaharlal Nehru, whom I admire? Thank you. <laughs> Why are you presuming that her third book is on Nehru? In fact, that was what I was going to I thought you were writing a trilogy on <laughs> Prime I mean, that's an assumption Ministers. and presumption on your part. I'd be, so I'm, 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 I'm curious. A, so I'm writing a trilogy, but I can't tell you who the third Prime Minister is. <laughs> so, uh, so there is another in the pipeline. The, the uh, next evening at Quorum, after she's finished her book, is going to be how much she empathizes, respects and admires Mr. Modi. You know? <laughs> <laughs> no! <laughs> All I can say is that it's a it's a it's a former prime minister. So, <laughs> so uh, no, I think the point about uh, about uh, uh, dynasty is well taken. I think, as I said, you know, every time Vajpayee um, lost an election, he had to step down. I mean, he lost in 1972. He lost assembly elections in 1972, and he had to step down. And Advani became uh, Jansang president in 1973. Uh, he lost elections in 1984. He had to step down. Advani became Vajpayee, uh, BJP president in 1986. So Vajpayee kept having to step down. His, you know, his career is full of setbacks where he kept having to step away from leadership positions. I think what you have now is uh, the dynastical principle in every party almost, where whether you win or lose, you are defeat-proof. And uh, you don't, uh, you know, you don't... You know, um, Sadhika, uh, you don't if, I, if yeah. I may just say something here in your question about dynastic... I think one, this is an overblown argument, you know, because I think the issue should more be about competence rather than whether you're a dynast or not. Because, you know, we accept it in every other profession, whether it's entrepreneurs or... As parents, you will always, you know, you grew up in a certain environment. In the musicians, we call it a gharana, you know. 
you grow up in a certain environment, your natural proclivity is to move to that profession. Doctors do it, lawyers do it. Film stars do it. I think the it. issue really is about competence. You know, are you a competent dynast or not? And, and the second factor that you were saying about admiring the BJP, I think what I constantly admire is one, they're truly democratic in who they give power to, who is allowed to grow. And second is endeavor. You know, I mean, 50 years, when you read this book, you really understand the sheer endeavor that went into their claiming their political space uh, in, in India. And one has to respect that. And only when you respect that can one really start disagreeing uh, with you know, whatever one disagrees with. But I think that both those points are there in, in, in the book. Yeah. <laughs> so I think Indira Gandhi, for example, was a dynast. But uh, I think in many ways, she outstripped her father. <laughs> So One more from back of the back bencher. <laughs> Thanks. I look forward to reading the book. Um, I'm curious, you were engaging in a hypothetical earlier. Is there space on today's right for a Vajpayee? Uh, ah, that's a very good question. Because it seems like, you know, a kind of roughly center-right position, um, you know, midpoint between liberalization and Swadeshi, midpoint between, I don't know, fascism and some, you know, a more centrist position. So how would he fare today? And is, uh, if, if you'll forgive me for being a bit cute, it, it, you know, the, 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 the um, or cheeky, the, the, you know, the left wing or the right wing likes to play good Muslim, bad Muslim, right? And, and sort of say, oh, you know, we're, we're okay with these kinds of Muslims, but not okay with, that's a right wing kind of uh, habit. And is this the left wing trying to play good Hindutva or bad Hindutva? <laughs> Very good questions, I must say. Uh, you know, I think that uh, where Vajpayee would be today was com it would be completely uh, marginalized. Uh, in fact, he was marginalized in uh, 1989 completely when he was asked that, you know, now are you in the margins? And he said, kabhi margin, uh, correction ke liye kabhi margin ki zarurat hota hai, you know, to make corrections. So I think uh, Vajpayee would be marginalized today. I think what's happened today is the right wing has been taken out, as I said, of the democratic game. So Vajpayee located his right-wing ideology, I think, in uh, small government, in liberalization, in privatization, and in Hindu conservatism. So I think, uh, you know, uh, to me as a liberal, and if you read, uh, read my book, Why I'm a Liberal, uh, one of the great um, uh, one of the great failures of post independence India has been the f the the loss of the Swatantra Party. I think the Swatantra Party, which emerged in 1959, was actually uh, well placed to take up this position of a kind of conservative right wing party uh, led by C. Rajagopalachari. And I think that would have been the natural home of Vajpayee. Uh, I think in today's times, in the kind of militant uh, militaristic. Uh, 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 BJP of today, or which, uh, a BJP that doesn't seem to be interested in parliamentary debate, doesn't seem to be interested in functioning within the parameters of parliament as Vajpayee was interested in doing. Uh, I think he would have been a misfit because he was rooted in parliament. You know, a lot of people have asked me, and this question has been asked to me before, that, you know, you're going on about the pluralism and secularism of Vajpayee, but what if he had a majority of 300 seats? I mean, would he still, you know, be pluralist and secularist if he didn't need, if he didn't need to keep his allies happy? And I think he would be. I think he would be uh, still a pluralist because he was rooted in parliament. And he was rooted in parliamentary democracy and parliamentary functioning. I think it would have been unthinkable for Vajpayee to do anything outside the ambit of parliament, to use uh, executive diktat to uh, dismember Jammu and Kashmir or to use executive diktat to bring in a law like the CAA. I think all of that would have been uh, would have been anathema to Vajpayee. So I think he would have been a misfit today, as most of that BJP generation is today. They are consigned to the Mark Darshak Mandal. So uh, they are, in a sense, uh, marginalized. And I think good Hindutva, bad Hindutva, yes. Why not? <laughs> Vajpayee was a uh, uh, conservative Hindu who, uh, who uh, existed within the parliamentary framework. Now, you know, this is the question I wrestled with as a liberal that does Hindu nationalism and Hindu conservatism have the right to exist as a viewpoint and as an ideology? Of course it does. If it exists within the parameters of parliament and within the parameters of parliamentary democracy, yes, it does have the... Trumpism exists, uh, Boris Johnson exists, conservative parties exist, uh, conservative party exists in the UK, 
the Republican Party exists in the uh, United States. So, of course, the Hindu nationalist and the Hindu conservative viewpoint as an ideology has the right to exist, provided it accepts the norms and rules and procedures of parliament and of constitutional democracy. And Vajpayee did that. You know, as he kept saying, Mariada me rehkar, simao ke bhitar. You know, you keep the honor of parliament and stay within your limits. Stay within the limits, rules, norms, and restraints of parliamentary democracy. And he kept mentioning this, you know, that uh, in 1996, his famous speech in parliament, he said, you know, the, what's important about democracy are the norms, the rules, the restraints, the 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 kanun, you know, the the kaide kanun. Yes, if you're staying within those rules and norms of democracy, you're a good Hindu and you have the right to exist. If you're not and you're you're uh, you know upsetting the democratic apple cart, then certainly that viewpoint cannot then be uh, sustained within the democratic freedom, uh, the democratic framework, right? So uh, if it's a question of uh, looking at Hindu nationalism and uh, saying that the ideology itself has no right to exist, I don't buy that. As a liberal, I certainly believe that every ideology has the right to exist, provided you accept the norms and restraints and rules of parliamentary democracy. And if you accept those, you are the good Hindu nationalist. Yeah. Uh, any more questions? Should we close? How Okay, Sagrika's book is right here for all of you who would like to pick it up. Please pick up a copy, get the author to sign. It's a privilege to have both of these amazing women uh, in our midst. Thank you, Sagrika and Thank Shoma. So really, if I had my way, we would keep going, but there is a man that I answer to, so uh, <laughs> a man. So uh, keep so going. It was so interesting. Thank, Thank you so much.